Uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming to our presentation. Um, so our presentation is on targeted adversarial examples for black box audio systems. Um, and we'd like to thank Geekpunk for hosting us. So a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Amog. I'm a student at UC Berkeley. Um, I am an officer at Machine Learning at Berkeley Organization, and I'm also a researcher at UC Berkeley Rise Lab. Hey everyone, I'm Rohan. Uh, I'm also a student at UC Berkeley. I'm the VP of Education at Machine Learning at Berkeley Organization, and I'm also a researcher at Berkeley AI Research, or BEAR. So uh, let's start off with a brief intro of uh, what exactly is an adversarial example. So in the most common sense, an adversarial example is something that is given to a model as input such that the model misclassifies its output, but to humans it looks, at, looks like if the model is getting it wrong. So for example, in this case, we have an image of a panda, and the model predicts it with 58% you know, confidence that it's a panda. That's a correct example. That's when the model gets it right. Now suppose we add some noise to it on the right, as you can see, it's multiplied by some really small magnitude, like 0 0.007, such that when you add this noise to the image, to humans, the humans can't tell the difference between the adversarial image and the normal image. So you can see here in the example, the panda looks exactly the same. But to the model, the model now thinks this image is a gibbon with 99% confidence. So this is an adversarial example because the model misclassified what the output was, even though to humans, it looks like it's still the original image. Okay, so um, going more about the definitions of adversarial examples, there's two types. Um, there's untargeted attacks and there's targeted attacks. Untargeted attacks means we provide input to the model to trick the model in order to make it misclassify the input as anything else. While a targeted attack, we provide input to the model such that we want the model to um, classify the uh, input as a predetermined target. So targeted, targeted attacks are more difficult than untargeted attacks because we, we're trying to trick the model into classifying it as something that was determined originally and to, a, to some specific class. Um, in addition, there's also white box attacks and black box attacks. So a white box, in a white box attack, we have complete knowledge over all the internals of the model. So we know its parameters and its architecture, and this allows for gradient computation. Uh, in a black box attack, we have uh, no knowledge of the model or the, any of its parameters except for the output logics of the model. This means that in a white box of attack, since you have more information, we can um, craft in a, better, a better and a more efficient attack. A black box attack, this becomes more difficult since we don't know any of the internals of the ML model. Cool, yeah. So now m many of you might be asking, why does this matter? So black box attacks can actually be of particular interest in ASR systems, ASR being automatic speech recognition. So if you look at a t typical deep model for an ASR system, this is kind of how it works. At the bottom, we have the raw audio um, wave file or the source. Um, typically, all the models use some sort of feature extraction. So typically, what is done is an MFCC conversion, which is basically it takes the audio file and converts it um, using a Fourier transform into the frequency domain. So you can see in the that, uh, colored graph over there, or the colored map, that's basically frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Now this graph is what's passed into the model. The model uses some sort of series of convolutional and recurrent layers um, to get a distribution of the output alphabet. And this alphabet is finally decoded into the final, um, final translated string. So this is the typical, a typical workflow of how a mo model works. So looking at this model, if we want to create an adversarial audio file, what we want to do is change the input audio file such that we can trick the model into translating what we want at the final, uh, at the final decoder step. And if we can do this with a black box approach, we can apply this pr to proprietary systems such as Google or IBM APIs for which we don't know the model architecture of the parameters. But we, if we use a black box approach, we can still craft adversarial examples to trick these systems and fool these systems. So some classic, there's some few classic adversarial examples. Um, so one uh, is the first method proposed, which is basically to take the gradient iterative, iteratively. So this is a white box targeted approach in which basically you take the gradient of the model output with respect to the input. And then you apply that gradient to the input and you keep repeating again and again and again as your adversarial example gets better. Fast gradient sign method, which is probably one of the most popular t forms of attacks, um, is a very simple method. Basically, you take the gradient of the input with respect to, with respect to the, your model parameters and you just take the sign of that gradient. So for example, if the gradient is negative at a particular place, you just make a negative one. If it's positive, you make it plus one. And you apply some very small perturbation. So in the example before you saw, we applied a magnitude of 0.007. You apply something like that. And it's just one gradient step, and you have an adversarial example. And so this is we're taking white box, untargeted uh, adversarial examples. And finally, there was a seminal paper by Houdini 
um, that explored adversary examples within the realm space of audio. So what he was able to do was create white box and black box adversarial examples for audio systems. However, a key limitation that he noticed was that he wasn't able to backpropagate through the MFCC conversion layer. What this meant was that he had adversarial spectrograms, but not necessarily adversarial raw audio files. So if you think of this in a real world setting, right, we want raw audio files to be played, to be played or given to an API. They won't accept spectrograms. So in this case, he was severely limited by not being able to create raw adversarial audio files, but only en ending up with the spectrograms. Okay, so now let's go over some prior work, uh, specifically in the audio in the audio realm. Uh, so there's two key papers in this area. One by UCLA, which is a black box genetic algorithm on single word classes. So this is a black box attack in which they didn't, in which they um, crafted adversarial examples without knowledge of any of the model parameters, and they do this via a genetic algorithm, which we'll cover uh, later. But the thing about this paper is that it's only on single word classes, which means they have a predefined set of uh, classes of just single words. And what, th what this means is they can use a soft max loss um, to try to trick the model into misclassifying a single word. Uh, the other paper is by Carlini and Wagner, also from UC Berkeley. And this is a white box attack. So they had access to the model parameters, and they were, they were able to do gradient computation. However, this wasn't on single word classes. They were actually able to generate uh, phrases and sentences of audio adversarial audio examples. Uh, so the way they do this is via something called a CTC loss, which you can see at the bottom. Um, a CTC loss allows for comparison with arbitrary length translations. Um, what this means is essentially that it's a way to score how well um, the original audio translates to a final like sequence, in this case, which is a target. Um, so it basically takes in like the final sequence and the, fi and the logits of the model and gives you some uh, probability that the, the, the model will predict our final sequence. Um, our project aims to combine um, parts of these two papers by doing a black box genetic algorithm approach, except trying to um, having, the, having the targets be phrases and sentences, and we do this via CTC loss. Um, so here's a quick, quick uh, diagram of our problem statement. Basically, how this works is that we'll have some benign input, which is like something like the without the data set, the article is useless. So this is a raw audio. That's the benign input. We want to be able to figure out a slight perturbation to the raw audio <laughs> via some adversarial noise, such that when we combine the benign input and uh, the, uh, the adversarial noise, that the ASR systems translate the audio as something <coughs> malicious, in this case, which is OK Google browse to evil.com. So as you can see, in a real world setting, if people are able to figure this out, it's going to actually potentially be harmful um, for people because the humans won't recognize the difference in the audio, but the ASR systems will translate it as something incorrect. So to explain it a little, more, a little bit more formally, what we're trying to do is a black box targeted attack for audio systems. So this means given a target T, this is your output translation, what you want the model to guess. So in our case, it would be, OK, you will browse to evil.com, and a benign input X, we want the model M we, and the model M. We want to perturb X with a very small, slight small delta to create X prime, such that when the model classifies M, uh, classifies X prime, M of X prime, that equals T or the given target T. We also want to do this with the constraint that we want to maximize the cross correlation between X and X prime. So in the audio realm, cross correlation is a measure of the similarity between your two audio files. So if we try and create an adversarial example that matches the target while maximizing the correlation between the original Bay 9 input and the adversarial input, that's basically saying we want to create a translation such that the model predicts it's wrong, but it's still as similar to the original audio file as possible. And remember, since this is a black box attack, we only have access to the logits, or the, out the output distribution over the alphabet um, of M. We don't have any access to the gradients or the model parameters. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So um, the model we use is deep speech. So this is the model we're targeting. Um, it's an architecture created by Baidu and published in a research paper. And then it was implemented in TensorFlow by Mozilla. And this is available on GitHub as an open source, uh, open source code. Um, so we used this attack, and we attacked this specific model on deep speech. Um, and the data set that we use is the common voice data set. So this consists of voice samples ranging from um, 3 to 7 seconds, and it's sampled at a rate of 16 kilohertz. So you can see in the bottom right, uh, that's a diagram of the deep speech model. Similar to other ASR systems, it accepts an input spectrogram. Um, then it passes it through some convolutional layers and a stacked bidirectional LSTM to finally get the out uh, output distribution over the alphabet. 
Okay, so, so this is our final algorithm, which is a guided selection, uh, which is a genetic algorithm approach. So basically how a genetic algorithm works is that it's rooted in evolutionary theory, and um, we start off with a benign input, and we first generate what's considered a population by adding random noise. So in our case, we generated a population of size 100 by adding just random noise to the original input. Then it, and it's an iterative process. So in each iteration, we score every sample in the population, pick the best ones, and then use those, use those high scoring samples to create a new population in the next what's called generation. And over time, as you can see, we'll eventually keep getting better and better samples to the point where we can actually fool the model. So in our case, on each iteration, we select the best 10 samples using a scoring function. And our scoring function is CTC loss, which is what we described earlier. Then we perform what's called crossover and uh, momentum mutation, um, which we'll go over in the next slide. And finally, we apply a high pass filter to the added noise. Um, the reason for this is a heuristic-based approach. Um, humans um, recognize low frequencies but more than high frequencies, so we apply a high-pass filter. We'll be able to basically um, tr still trick the model, but uh, make it less recognizable for a human ear. So this is a visual demonstration of what's going on in our algorithm. So initially, we start off with a population of about 100 audio samples. This is generated by adding random noise. Then we'll evaluate each with the CTC loss, and we'll calculate a fitness score. Out of this, we'll pick this elite population, uh, which is basically the top 10 um, of the sample. And then in order to get the next generation, we'll perform something called crossover mutation. So in uh, evolutionary theory, basically, the way you get from one generation to the next is you choose a, a two parents from this elite sample, and then you perform a crossover. So you can see we chose the two, two samples, the red and the gold, and perf we perform cross crossover. So we'll randomly choose uh, either the red or the gold attribute at every index. And at that point, we can kind of combine them together to get this, like, layered approach of red and gold. And so this is basically saying like, all right, we have, our, uh, we have our elite population, we'll choose a couple as parents, and from them we'll create a child. And, and that'll, that'll generate the red and gold sequence. Finally, the last step is that we want to add some variation to each generation. So we'll do that using a mutation. So this is a randomly applied mutation, and we have a special form of adding this mutation called momentum mutation, which, which we'll cover in the next slide. But the basic idea is we'll start with this population, we'll choose the best, We'll use these parents to create these children, and then we'll finally add some cleverly added noise um, in order to create some random and create some randomness in the samples. So you'll see that um, you'll see that uh, uh, over time, the best traits um, for our samples will c carry on from generation to generation, while the traits which are not affecting our score will eventually die out. Okay, so now we go over momentum mutation, which is basically our our unique way of adding mutation to our samples. So in a normal, in a standard genetic algorithm, um, the probability of having a mutation is, uh, is static from generation to generation. Um, what we're trying to do is change the probability of mutation and make it dynamic and um, have that be a function of the difference in scores across the iterations of the generations. And we do, what we do is if there's little increase in score between the generations, we increase the momentum by increasing the probability of the mutation. And if there's a higher score, um, higher difference of scores between the generations, we decrease the probability of mutation. And the reason for this is that if we see very little increase in score across generations, which is basically, basically what we need to do is give their algorithm a little kick, and we do that by increasing the randomness in our um, algorithm. And, and doing so will allow us to basically move out of like a, what, a local minimum and globally optimize. So if we're stuck at like a local minimum, we provide more increased probability of mutation, increase the randomness, and the goal is to eventually go out of that little, like escape out of that little hump and be able to continue our optimization. So what this does is it encourages um, the decoding to build up to the target after making the input similar to silence. So as you can see in the blue box on the right, um, our decodings while training first start off with the original um, benign input, and slowly it it, it, get, um, it pairs down the letters till we get to near silence, which is the E now. And through this momentum mutation, we can, um, by increasing the probability of the mutation, we can add more letters and our, and our algorithm is able to finally get our target of hello world. Yep. So this genetic algorithm approach works best when the search space is large. So as you, as you, as you may have heard, we just randomly add mutations and hope that we get something good. However, when the adversarial example is near the target, we only need a few key perturbations um, you know, to correctly classify it. We only, like, only a few key perturbations are necessary. So in this case, genetic algorithms are not the best approach because they'll randomly add noise to a bunch of different places that we don't necessarily want noise. We only want noise in a few specific places. 
So at this step, we apply a gradient estimation. So the way gradient estimation works is we basically suppose our sampling rate is 16,000 kilohertz, like we said. That means for a one second audio clip, we have 16,000 points of evaluation. For gradient estimation, for each point, we randomly perturb it, either up or down. And then we pass it through the model and see what the difference in scores is. Finally, we combine all of these um, to get our gradient estimate. You can think of this as a limit derivative, kind of. Um, basically, we were perturbing each index up and down and seeing how much that changes the final loss and using that as an estimate of the gradient. Now, you might have heard me say, for a one second audio clip, there's 16,000 possible indices. So, of course, this is going to be a lot of computation for just one gradient step. So as a heuristic, in order to kind of reduce the computation cost, we randomly choose 100 best indices and apply the gradient estimation to those points and keep iterating again and again. OK, so let's go over some results. Um, so we tested on the first 100 samples of the common voice data set. And our target phrases are randomly generated uh, two target words. So our targeted attack similarity is 89.25%. So this is a similarity between our target and the final uh, translated sequence after 3,000 generations. And we calculated this using a Levenstein distance. And our average similarity score is 94.6%. So this is similarity between the original benign input and our perturbed adversarial input. And this is computed via cross-correlation, as described earlier. So let's put these results into perspective by comparing to some of the baselines. So as Amog mentioned earlier, we have two baselines we're explicitly comparing to. The Carlini and Wagner paper that describes white box attacks on CTC loss, and the UCLA paper describing uh, black box attacks on a single word softmax loss. So as you can see, um, our attack success rate is 35% for, for basically Levenstein distance of zero, like exactly correctly classifies it as the targeted input. Uh, for the gradient estimation, or for, uh, for the gradient-based approach, it was 100%, while for this softmax loss, it's 87%. So this may seem low, but thinking about it in the black box perspective of how complex it is to kind of optimize over longer phrases rather than just one softmax loss, um, we can see that our results are, are pretty competitive. And the average similarity score, we kept at 94.6%. For the gradient-based approach, it was 99.9%, and for the black box approach, it was 89%. And as you can see here on the graph on the bottom, we have a histogram of the Levenstein distances um, after our attack of over 3,000 generations. So you can see, basically, the distribution is very near zero. We have a large percentage that are at zero, meaning they're exactly correctly classified, and more with just a couple or a, couple or a few points off of the Levenstein distance. What this means is that there's an inherent trade-off between how much we run the algorithm and the, uh, the attack with success rate. So as you can see, if we run the algorithm for longer, our average similarity score will drop as we add more random noise and add more, add more mutations. However, we'd be able to get a higher attack success rate um, and bump that score up. So in a real world setting, if an adversary is trying to crack a system, he could, employ these, he could employ these metrics. He could toggle between the two, see which setting is better for him, and adjust the rate accordingly. OK, so now let's uh, try to listen to some examples. So we have here. Um, the original uh, original input file, um, which is which decodes to and you know it. Let's see if we can play this. Okay, well. Okay, well, okay, we're having some difficulties of playing this, but what you'll hear is that this is the original input file and gets decoded as and you know it. The adversarial target is, um, is, is our perturbed uh, audio, which, which to the human sounds very similar to the original. It sounds like and you know it, but it gets decoded as hello world. And um, as we mentioned before, audio similarity is 94.6% um, using cross-correlation metric. And you can see uh, on the bottom right a, a, a spectrogram of our, uh, the original audio input and our perturbed example. So our perturbed example is blue, the original is orange, and you can see there's very slight perturbations. Most of it is very similar to the original benign input. So um, there's a bunch of future work to be done in this area. Um, one of the most important ones is attacking a broader range of models. So as you mentioned, we only attacked the deep speech model by Mozilla, uh, since this was the only open source uh, ASR deep system implementation that we could find. However, it'll be interesting to see if this, is, if this attack is transferable across models. Not only in transformable the sense of can we optimize over deep speech and then deploy it on IBM or Google APIs, but also can we optimize on those APIs as well. 
Second is over-the-air attacks. So in our problem statement, you, you might have seen that we put, you know, kind of the adversary audio in the same physical space as the original audio to, do, to uh, fool the Google Home. However, in this case, we're passing directly the raw audio or like source loss digitally to the model. So we haven't seen over-the-air attacks have displayed over the air how robust they would be to these different perturbations. And finally, increasing the sample efficiency to target. So currently, we train for 3,000 iterations in order to get a successful audio decoding. And for a population size of 100, that means 300,000 evaluations just for one audio file. So for example, Google and uh, IBM APIs, which can, which can be quite expensive, this cost can be prohibitive. So increasing the sample efficiency of this uh, attack can allow us to see um, with the kind of physical real world limitations, what can we achieve? Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for listening to our presentation. Um, if you'd like to read our paper, it's available as a preprint on Archive. Um, and the code and samples are also available on GitHub um, under Black Box Audio Repo uh, on, on Rohan's uh, account. So, yeah, we can take any questions if uh, anyone has any. Yes. So you generate your perturbation the brand of noise and time domain. Then you filter in the hot hat filter. And that's what you're applying to your to your uh sample. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then once we apply that, we kinda use those popul those samples as the next generation in our algorithm. Any more questions? Okay, uh, thank you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah.